Are you, can you just kind of speak? Okay. So, hello, continue? Yeah. Okay, so do, do you have any other questions before we move on to the next part about the basics? We know now where the impulse is going. We know the direction, how the impulse is conducted through the heart. We know where the leads, which sides of the heart, or which sites of the heart the leads are measuring. And because we know the axis, we know whether they'll be positive or negative. Now, these are the components of the ECG. And as I mentioned, the best way to approach the ECG, if you're in an uh, exam and they give you the question, this ECG, uh, analyze this ECG, or when you're doing rounds in the hospital and the physician or the consultant gives you an ECG paper and tells you, what do you think of this ECG? The best way to go about it is to be uh, systematic. And this slide is probably the most important slide in the whole lecture. And we will re be repeating everything on the slide multiple times, inshallah, so you will memorize it by the time we finish. So, the first thing, patient data. You want to make sure you have the right patient. And it's happened before. We've seen uh, rounds where the physicians were discussing ECGs of completely different patients. And it confuses things a lot. That's the first thing. The second thing, any history or physical you know will help pinpoint you to diagnosis, will help direct you to which uh, abnormalities you want to look for. And they also present risk factors, like age could be a risk factor for arrhythmias, MIs, and other things like that. The next thing you have are the three R's. Rhythm, rate, and relation of the P wave to the QRS, basically if the rhythm is sinus or not. Yes. Patient data, and then the three R's. Rhythm, rate, and relation of the P wave. Next thing you have is the axis. We know what the normal axis is. We want to make sure that it's normal or if the impulse is going in another direction. Lastly, you have the parts of the ECG, and this is straightforward. You start from the P wave and you keep going until you reach the end of the uh, T wave. You have the P wave, the PR interval, the QRS wave, the ST segment, QT interval, and T wave. And we're going to discuss all of these, well, except the patient data. This is for your clinical lectures. But we will be discussing all of these, the normal, and the common abnormalities that you need to know. By the way, you will get a copy of this presentation, so you don't have to write down everything. Now, the rhythm. These are the leads that we know. One, two, three, AVR, AVL, and AVF. V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. Then at the bottom, they usually give you a rhythm strip. This is the strip that you want to use to analyze your rhythm. And it's usually like lead 2 or V1 or something like that. And this is the, the strip that will be from that lead from the beginning to end. Unlike here, like look, here you have 2, you start with lead 2. You have 1, 2, 3 beats, and then starting from here you have uh, AVL. But no, the rhythm strip is one lead and it measures it continuously from that lead from beginning to end. Uh, a hint to help you when you're uh, doing the ECG, when you're looking at the ECG, if you want to analyze something, try to find it when it's on a, a, a clear line. Mm -hmm. For example, if I want to look at the rhythm, I'll take this QRS complex right here. And then I check before it, because it's, it seems to be almost exactly on the line. And I check before it, one, two, three, four, four and a half almost. Four, yeah. And then one, two, three, four, also four and a half. And then I take this one, this one also seems to be on the uh, line, so one, two, three, four, four and a half. So if I measure, it's the same. The rhythm is the same. The, the spaces between the QRS complexes is the same. So this is how I know that this rhythm is regular or not. Clear? Yeah. You use the rhythm strip and then measure the distance between the QRS complexes to make sure that they are uh, equal or not. Now, let's take a look at this. Who would like to give this a shot? Anyone? Okay, sure. Go ahead. You have two strip lines here, two rhythm strips, V1 and 2. Okay. Use any one of you want. So I will take, um, okay, I will take the, the, before the, 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 okay, the point. This one? Yeah, yeah, and this one. Where? Okay, one has a tie in this one. V1? Okay, yeah. Can I measure from here the letter? Okay, sure. Okay, so I will, like, I will try from this one here, exactly. Okay. So Okay, now look at this one. Does this one yeah, look like four? It's, it's not regular. Okay, look at this one. 
This one's almost on the QRS complex. Try this one. One. Okay, and here behind it. Okay, so this is clearly irregular. Irregular, yes, thank you. It is not regular. Exactly, some people are already uh, saying that it's irregularly irregular. Now, most of the time when you get an irregular rhythm, it's irregularly irregular. Sometimes you get regularly irregular. What does that mean? Simply it means, for example, let's say you have, okay, one beat, normal beat, normal beat, normal beat, skip beat. Normal beat, normal beat, normal beat, skip beat. Normal beat, normal beat, normal beat, skip beat. Basically, it's irregular, but there's a pattern. You can clearly measure the pattern. You can say, okay, I know there's going to be three normal beats, then a drop beat. Three normal beats, then a skip beat. This is regularly irregular. But what, you most like, what you're most likely to get is this one, an irregularly irregular. There's no pattern. And here, there's like, what, three almost? This one's four. This one's five and a half. There's no pattern. This is what we call irregularly irregular. Now, what is the most likely diagnosis of an irregularly irregular rhythm? Uh, yes, which are Atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation, thank you. We're going to go into further detail, but there are several causes. The most important one you need to know for now is an irregularly irregular rhythm is most likely going to be an atrial fibrillation. There are, there are other causes, but yes, this is the most important you need to know. Regarding the rate, Yanni, um, is it possible to have uh, a different rate and rhythm at all the reads to, to, to make sure that the rate is normal? The rhythm, the rhythm is Yes, yes. Uh, the, the rate? No, rate. No, we're coming to the rate. But this is, this is something important because you want, to, you want to check all the QRS complexes to make sure that the rhythm, because sometimes it, can, it could be normal or regular, I'm sorry, and then all of a sudden it becomes irregular like at the last three QRS complexes. We actually have a, we, we had a physician in our rotation, in the cardio rotation, who had a compass for the two needles. <laughs> and he'd take the ECG and he'd go from the beginning to the end, make sure that all of them were the same size. The distance between all of them the, was the same distance. So yeah. Important to analyze it from beginning to end. But I mean, when you clearly have something like this, Hollis, you know it's irregularly irregular. Yeah. Wait, if it's irregular, 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 then I know that it's atrial No, it's most likely, most likely, but there are other causes. Okay. But as a medical student, what you'll most likely, what we'll most likely be asked about is uh, atrial fibrillation. So we discussed the first thing, the first component is the patient data. Second component was R's. the three R's, exactly. What's the first R? Ray, rhythm, Ray. Rhythm. Relation. Rhythm. Relation. Relation. The sinus wave or not. Whether it's, I'm sorry, whether it's sinus rhythm or not. Now we discussed the rhythm. The next thing we're going to talk about is the rate. We know that the normal heart rate is 60 to 100. 60 to 100. Less than 60, we call it? Right. More than 100? Exactly. This is why you check the rhythm before you check the rate because you calculate it differently depending on the uh, rhythm. If the rhythm is regular, you take the number of big squares between the QRS complexes and 300 divided by the number of big squares. So if they're regular, you can have the QRS. Okay, and then? You can multiply by six. And then you multiply by six, exactly. Why, why, why by six? 60 seconds, 60 seconds. Okay, yes, the rhythm strip we said was 10 seconds usually. So you multiply by six, you'll know how many QRS complexes there will be in 60 seconds. Now, quick tip to help you. Sometimes you don't want to know the exact heart rate, but you just want to know if the heart rate is normal or not. When, you look, when you're looking at the QRS complexes, if the large squares between them are three to five, this is normal. Mm -hmm. And let's calculate it. 300 divided by three is what? 100. 100, which is the upper limit of normal. 300 divided by five is what? It's 60. 60, which is the lower limit of normal. If you have more than five uh, large squares between the QRS complexes, Red. this is red. Red. If you have less than three, this is a lot of QRS complexes, this is tachycardia. Clear? Yep. 300 divided by the number of large squares between the QRS complexes. Don't use the P waves, and we'll know later why. You want to use the QRS complexes. Now, again, try to find one that's on the line. This, how many squares? Three. About three. three. A bit, maybe a bit less, but okay, let's just uh, estimate and say 3. The heart rate here is? 100. 100. Here? 2. Two. It's about 150. Rhythm. What's the rhythm like? It's regular. It seems to be regular, exactly. Here. Take this one. Look at how many squares. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, almost 6.5. 
Take this one. One, two, three, four, five, six, six and a half. It is regular, exactly, yes. It's regular. So you do 300 divided by the number of large squares, 6.5. So this is? Can we tell what these is this without? Okay, you want to guess? Yes. Can we? You want to guess? I want to guess, but I'm trying. Yeah, okay. No, no, somebody said P wave, yes. So? It's not really inverted. Biphasic, exactly. Which lead would that make it? Uh, somebody said it, somebody said it. Wait, wait. V1. V1. It's V1, exactly. And we're, we're going to discuss the P wave later. So, quickly, you want to analyze. This is normal or not? You don't want to know the exact heart rate. Just, you want to make normal. sure that. No, no, no. Normal, exactly. You take this one, this one's on the QRS. One, two, three, four, four and a half. It's between three to five. Can you explain your system, this is the data of three, five, five, based on the ATP. Based on the what? On the ATP. Yeah, yeah, here. Okay. This, this, was, this was it. Right away. Okay, I count this. Okay. This, one's on, this one's the closest thing I can find to the, QR, to, the, to the line. One, two, three, four, four and a half. Okay, it's normal. Okay. It's between three to five. Yeah, I only count the large boxes because a lot of times, especially when we were doing the rounds, the doctor would tell me when the doctor would give us the ECG paper and you start counting, okay, and then 300, they tell you no, no, just tell me, is the heart rate normal or not? So this is a quick way if you want to make sure patient's tachycardic, bradycardic, just okay, is it between three to five? If it is, then the patient's heart rate you know is normal, and then you can move on to something else. So you don't waste your time trying to find the heart rate when it doesn't provide much value. Okay, we said the first thing, patient data. Second thing, three, three, hours. three, three hours. hours. The first R is? Rhythm. Right. Second R? Right. Third R? Sinus. Okay, why do we call it sinus? Because we know normally the... the I'm sorry? The Yes, the sinal atrial node is the one that starts the impulse. You should have a normal P wave appearing before each QRS. This indicates that the heartbeat is originating from the SA node. Now let's say, for example, let's go back to this one. Okay, this P wave before each QRS, I can call this sinus bradycardia. Yep. Clear? Yeah. Okay. Yes? Because there are other forms of bradycardia that are not sinus. There are some forms of tachycardia that could be sinus tachycardia. For example, this, let's say this. This is a P wave. Clear? P wave. P wave. P wave. P wave. P wave. P wave. What do we call this? We call it sinus tachycardia, exactly. If there's a P wave before each QRS complex in a tachycardia, this is sinus tachycardia. There are other causes of tachycardia where the heart rate is not coming from the SA node. It's coming from another area, so this could be other forms of tachycardia. Okay. Clear? This is the T wave. P wave? QRS? The P wave is coming over the T wave because that's how fast the heart rate is. You see? Yes. Okay, well, it should be normal. What? It's not, yes, exactly. It shouldn't also, not just a P wave, it should be a normal P wave. And we're going to discuss the P wave later on. Because there are some times when it looks like a P, like, okay, we know, we know the axis of the heart, correct? Yeah. What if the P wave, or what if the heartbeat originates ectopically from the left atrium? The P wave could be inverted. Yeah. It looks like a P wave, but it's not normal. In this case, we don't call it sinus tachycardia, we call it ectopic atrial tachycardia. Okay, so yes, there should be a normal P wave before each QRS. That's how you call it sinus rhythm or not. Because there are sometimes abnormal P waves because of an ectopic heartbeat. And uh, you will get a lecture on the supraventricular tachycardias. These are the supraventricular tachycardias, and these are the ones that you really want to look at the morphology of the P wave. And we will discuss the P wave in further detail. But a normal P wave before each QRS is sinus uh, rhythm. It could be sinus tachycardia, it could be normal sinus rhythm, or it could be sinus bradycardia. Yes? Yes. Okay. P wave, QRS, T wave. P wave, QRS, T wave. P wave, QRS, T wave. P wave, QRS, T wave, P wave, QRS wave, T wave, 
P wave, QRS, T wave. Okay? Okay. Because this is really fast. And if you remember, uh, in tachycardia, which, uh, which phase of the heart gets affected the most? The systole or diastole? Diastole. You can see diastole here is like almost no diastole. T wave right after that P wave. Okay, sinus rhythm, you see? Normal PRP P wave before each QRS, this tells us that this is sinus rhythm. We already discussed the patient data, the three R's, the next thing was the axis. Okay. Now, uh, we discussed the axis in each lead, but when we wanna know the, the axis of the patient's heart itself, we're not gonna go through each and every lead. We look mainly at lead one and ABF to make things simple. And we discussed normally they are both positive, correct? Yeah. Lead one is towards the left, so it's measuring towards your left arm. Yeah. And ABF is towards the feet, measuring towards the feet. And because the impulse is going down to the left, both of them will be positive. This way. Now, let's say this is normal. Lead one and ABF both positive. Now let's say uh, there is left axis deviation. Basically the impulse of the patient's heart, rather than going from here, from the AV node down like this, it's going this way. And we're not gonna go too much into the causes of this. It's, it can be a bit complicated to understand, but like one of the most important causes is hypertrophy of the ventricles. And I think that makes sense. If you have hypertrophy of the left ventricle, there'll be a lot more impulse going towards the left side than there is towards the right the balance will be shifted more towards the left because there will be more heart muscle, more cardiac muscle on the left side, so more electrical activity on the left side, so the impulse will be shifted more towards the left. And the opposite happens for the right side. There are other causes like bundle branch block, but honestly, sometimes it's really difficult to understand why. So uh, I don't want to complicate, confuse things, and mainly I don't really know why. But So let's just focus on the, the axis deviation itself. Uh, Left axis deviation. Now lead one, we said is here. AVF is here. If the axis shifts more towards the left and upwards, like in this area, it's still going towards lead one, correct? The, the axis now, instead of going down to the yellow area, is going towards the red area, this way. It's still going towards lead one. Yeah. So lead one will remain positive. positive. But what about AVF? Rather than initially it was going this way towards AVF, but now it's going this way, which is negative. away from AVF, exactly. So AVF becomes negative. In left axis deviation, lead one remains positive, AVF becomes negative. You look at the QRS complexes uh, in the ECG, if the QRS of lead one and AVF left each other, is left axis deviation. So we don't consider. Okay. Yeah, yes, yeah, just go ahead. Yeah, I mean, there are sometimes, especially for example, if you have like uh, uh, the uh, athletes that have enlarged hearts, uh, sometimes the leads are not exactly placed. So yes, there are different criteria of what is normal axis deviation, when you can accept it and when you can't. But for the sake of this uh, brief review, we're going to focus mainly on the way it will manifest and how you can tell if this is axis deviation or not. Think, but yes, you're right. I mean, there are there are many criteria. There are criteria for axis deviation. You have criteria for pathological Q waves. You have criteria for ST. And not only that, the criteria can differ from source to source. And some people will tell you this criteria. Other people will tell you that criteria. We had two different consultants on the same day discuss ECGs with us and tell us two different things. So uh, yes, it can you can have different criteria depending on what source you use. But uh, what I'd advise you to do is stick to the criteria the professor is giving you. I didn't want to include any criteria to avoid confusing you. Just stick to whatever criteria. The prof if the professor told you negative 30 is the normal limit, then fine. Negative 30 is the normal limit. Any other questions? Okay, so if the QRS complexes left each other, left axis deviation. The, now let's say the other thing happens. You've got, let's say, for example, a right ventricular hypertrophy. The impulse will shift more towards the right, more electrical activity on the right side. AVF will remain positive. 
But what happens to lead one? Now instead of the impulse going here towards lead one, it's the this way. of lead one and lead AVF, and they're pointing right at each other, this is right axis deviation. If the QRS complexes left each other, left axis, if they're pointing right at each other, right axis deviation. Clear? And now, theoretically, let's say theoretically, you shift, it goes backwards, this way. Huh? Both of them will be negative. But the most important thing is left axis. If the QRS complex is left each other, you have left axis deviation. If they're pointing right at each other, right axis deviation. Okay. Now, what's this? Okay, the lead one is positive. What about AVF? AVF is negative. Look, A lead one is mainly positive. AVF, mainly negative. Left axis, okay, who else agrees left axis? Left axis, left axis. Okay, the QRS complexes of one and AVF left each other. They're pointing in different directions. So this is left axis deviation. Okay, this is positive. This is negative. They left each other, left <laughs> axis deviation. What if they meet each other? If they point right at each other, right axis deviation, like this. Look at this. If they left each other, like here, it's left axis deviation. If they point right at each other, right They're axis deviation. Right. Clear? So this, they left each other. This one's pointing up, this one's pointing down. This is left axis deviation. Yeah. Normal is thumbs up. Huh? Normal. Normal is both of them pointing together. Okay, thumbs up, double thumbs up. Yeah. Both of them pointing in the same direction. Thank you. Okay. So we said the patient data, the three R's, which are rhythm, rhythm rate, 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 relation of the P wave to the QRS. The next thing was axis. And then finally we have components. the components parts. of the ECG, the, the wave parts. Now, let's take a 10 minute break for those who haven't prayed and need to pray. We'll come back after 10 minutes. It's 6.5 now, 6.15 we'll come back. The rest will take about half an hour. We'll finish in half an hour and we'll leave the rest of the time for questions. So 6.15 we'll continue. Until they come, this where we have to start. For time's sake, play. I think this is what you were asking me about in the beginning, correct? Mm -hmm. The lead placement and this. Uh, okay, uh, I'll discuss it at the end because this is not really very important. Let's discuss the most important clinical things first. And then at the end, uh, I'll stay and talk about this. This is pure physics and I don't recall us ever getting any questions on this. The most important thing for you to know is which aspect of the heart does uh, each lead measure. Now, we, we, we discussed the patient data, we discussed the three R's, the rhythm, the rate, and the sinus, or not the relation of the P wave. We talked about the axis, and the last thing we're going to talk about are the parts of the ECG. We're going to start from the P wave uh, until, we reach the, uh, T, until we reach the T wave. The first thing we have is the P wave, and do we all know what the P wave represents? Atrial depolarization, exactly. And this, if it's a normal P wave, that means it's coming from the SA node, and it should appear before each QRS interval for us to call this rhythm a sinus rhythm. And when you want to look at the P wave, you want, when you want to see if the P wave is normal, has a normal morphology or not, you look at lead two and lead uh, V1. V1 and V1. So the lead in lead two, it should be upright, 2.5 by 2.5 small squares, and V1, it should be bipolar, which we've already seen. The negative deflection is one by one small squares. And why am I bothering you with these measurements? Because they are important. The measurements, if they are altered, you could have uh, atrial enlargement. Again, P wave represents atrial depolarization, pathology and P wave problem with the atrium. Generally speaking, uh, again, without mentioning specific criteria, if the amplitude of the P wave is higher, this is most likely uh, right atrial enlargement. If the width if, or the duration of the P wave is longer, this is most likely left atrial enlargement. There are specific criteria. Okay. Uh, the amplitude, you look at the amplitude of the P wave. If the uh, amplitude is higher, generally this is right atrial enlargement. If the duration is longer, 
this is left atrial enlargement. And you said this is, okay, repeat it one more time. The P wave is atrial depolarization. Uh, should appear before each QRS interval to be sinus rhythm. When we want to look at the morphology, we look at lead 2 and V1. And lead 2 should be upright 2.5 by 2.5 small squares, 2.5 small squares high, 2.5 or 3 small squares wide. And V1 should be bipolar, which we've already seen in the <coughs> bradycardia slide. Here, I'll show you again. Let's go back to the bradycardia. Okay, this slide, remember? The biphasic P wave here. Yeah. In V1, yeah. the negative deflection should be one by one small square. Okay, and the reason why I'm telling you these measurements is because any alteration in the measurements indicates atrial enlargement. Uh, can I ask a question? Sure. We when we want to check the atrial size, we look at lead two and V1. These are the normal. You can look at other leads, but to make things simpler, these are the most important two. If the amplitude is higher. Generally, this means right atrial enlargement. If the duration is longer, if the wave is wider, this is most likely left atrial enlargement. And the criteria are whatever the doctor tells you in the uh, in his lectures. Yes. Um, regarding the bipolar uh, bi shape, yeah, uh, bi uh, both of them not the uh, two become, يعني, and the negative deflection is one. one the negative. Look, mainly the negative deflection. One so what the positive? Point. There is a positive and negative. The positive can be variable, but the ne the, the, when you want to see the size, you look at the negative deflection. Only. Yes, the negative is the most important thing. Here, but this is lead uh, two. Oh, yes, sorry. So the higher amplitude uh, indicates you have... Uh, most likely right atrium. Right atrium. Yeah, right, right atrium enlargement. And wider, most likely left atrium enlargement. This is the normal P wave. As you can see, it's, it's smaller than 2.5 by 2.5. Once it becomes larger, that's when it becomes worrisome. And I'm not sure if you can see it clearly here, but this is the biphasic. It goes up. There's a positive deflection and a negative deflection. Can you see it? Yeah. Positive here, negative here. This is V1. Now, we've seen this, this image before. This ECG, we've seen it before. Uh, remember what we were talking about here? We were talking about the rhythm. Exactly. The rhythm here we discussed was irregular. Yeah. Irregularly irregular. But now we're looking at it from the P wave's perspective. Now, can you see a clear P wave? No. No. What do you see? You see a lot of these, what we call fibrillation waves. Basically what happens in atrial fibrillation is that there are different parts of the atria, many parts depolarizing and repolarizing at different times. So the atria ends up fibrillating. It doesn't contract as one unit. Each, each small amount of muscle fibers are contracting and relaxing at different times because of these fibrillation waves. Uh, the fibrillation waves plus irregularly irregular rhythm is most likely atrial fibrillation and what happens is because the atria is not contracting there's stasis of blood and when they're, whenever there's stasis of blood anywhere in the body what happens? Thrombosis. Clots start forming. So you worry about thrombosis and embolism it can embolize to the brain causing stroke embolize to the bowels, to the kidneys that's why the treatment you have to anticoagulate them very importantly and they can be tachycardic if they are uh, then you have to use rate control you have to use drugs to slow down the heart rate this is an example of a supraventricular tachycardia. Basically, it's a tachycardia that starts from above the ventricle. Now, look at this P wave. Or P waves. What's happening here? Oh. Well, it's higher than to higher than to white five squares. No, you can't, you can't measure size because you don't know what lead this is. You, don't, you can't look at size here. But look at this. Look how many P waves. We have one, like two, tachycardia, but for, for sinus? No, no. Take a, wait, wait, wait. You want, you want to say tachycardia. I can tell right now it's not tachycardia. Look, one, yeah. two, three, four. This is not... <laughs> only two. Huh? Lala, that's why you use the QRS complex when you want to measure the heart rate. But you, yes, but you are correct. The atrial heart rate is, flat, is, is very fast. Atrial heart rate is, like, look at this. There's almost 300. It's almost one box between them. The atria is firing at almost 300 uh, beats per minute. And you see the pattern? It looks like... A, the teeth of a saw. Chainsaw. Yeah. What is this? Saw. Saw tooth appearance. What is the diagnosis of a saw tooth appearance? P wave? Flutter. flutter. Atrial flutter. This classic appearance. This is a saw tooth appearance. This is, yeah, a classic. They bring it in the exam, they bring in the use of it. This is a classic saw tooth appearance. It looks like the teeth of a saw. Very fast. Look at this. It's like almost one square between them. Yes. Atrial flutter is. 
We're going to talk about it. See, this is what we call a re-entry circuit. Yeah, and we used to see this word a lot in, uh, in our basic sciences here, and it caused us quite a bit of headache because we didn't understand what's happening. Basically, what you have in a re-entry circuit is that there's a part of the heart, like a circuit, and the impulse is constantly traveling through the circuit again and again and again and again at a very fast heart rate, very fast rate. So it's constantly being excited, this circuit, and what happens is it ends up exciting the rest of the heart muscle, constantly. For this is atrial flutter, basically what's happening is that there's a circuit in the atria, and the atria is constantly firing very, very quickly. It's not coming from the uh, SA node. There's a circuit, there's a, there's a circle of muscle tissue that has an impulse constantly going through it in a circle. It never stops. But it doesn't travel anywhere. Huh? It doesn't go like to the ventricle. It does, yes, because, when it, because as the electrical impulse stimulates this ring, it will end up stimulating the muscles around it, the atria around it. Once it stimulates the atria around it, it will go to the uh, AV node, and then from the AV node to the ventricles. So yes, it, this atrial flutter can also be a, another cause of a supraventricular tachycardia. Now basically, the, there's different theories as to why a re-entry circuit can develop, and some of them are really complicating, there's some dispute. But this is the one that most commonly people agree upon. Basically what happens is when you get a depolarization, the depolarization propagates through the heart like this, and we know that if depolarization reaches a muscle that's already depolarized, it stops. You mm -hmm. cannot depolarize muscle that's already been depolarized. What happens is, in a re-entry circuit, is um, for some reason, uh, whether it's injury, for example, or ischemia, a portion of the heart stops propagating impulses in one direction. So the impulse comes down like it does above, it comes down here, it stops here because of the injured area here, and it continues down this way. It excites this, the remaining area of the heart. As it's coming down here, sorry, as it's coming down here, it doesn't meet the depolarized area it used to. It will continue going, or stimulate the rest of the heart, but then it goes back up this way and it can go through this area. This is a unidirectional block, it blocks in one area, but this ischemic area will allow it to travel through this way, or this fibrotic area, or whatever it is, this injured area will allow the impulse to travel in the other direction. By the time the impulse comes down here and goes through this unidirectional block, this area has been depolarized, repolarized, and it's just ready for another signal. So it stimulates it again, and then it comes down. Just activate this part of the heart, continue this way, activate this part, goes back, and keeps going in the circuit. This is a re-entry circuit. This is the major pathophysiology behind most of the tachycardias you get, whether it's uh, atrial uh, fibrillation or atrial flutter. In atrial fibrillation, you're going to have many, many, many small uh, um, re-entry circuits. In atrial flutter, you have one big re-entry circuit that's stimulating the whole atria. This is the pathology behind it, and that's why some of these conditions, like atrial flutter, can be treated with ablation. Basically, what they do is they go and they try to ablate the circuit and stop it. Um. Why will it be blocked? Like, yeah. These are causes. There could be ischemia, scar tissue, enlargement of the chamber, bypass tracts. There are different causes, but mainly it's ischemia. Usually, whenever there's ischemia, there's a portion of the muscle that, or a portion of the heart that stops transmitting impulses properly. And the impulses can go around it, or can go through it in an abnormal way that will allow them to create a circuit. Even if the cells are dead, like in ischemia? When you have important cells, it doesn't mean that all the cells, there could be some areas conducting and other areas are not. It's not, well, it's not yeah, necessarily yeah. one uniform area of death. So, Dr. Uh, yes. uh, you have many firing at the uh, same time. Yeah. Yes. Here, here you could have, for example, an atrial reentry circuit. Here you have a ventricular reentry circuit. Okay. No, the SA node is not. This is not, if you look at this, this is not a sinus rhythm. You can tell this is not because there's not a normal P wave. I know, but then I, I'm confused on the point, why is the ventricles not getting um, depolarized? Exactly. Like, why can't they do, they, they do, do. yes. But not in the same case, like not yes, it, the same yes, okay, I wasn't sure whether I wanted to talk about this or not, but okay, I'll tell you because you brought it up, I'll bring it up. Normally, atrial flutter doesn't look like this when the patient first presents. Atrial flutter will usually present the tachycardia. In fact, usually, Atrial flutter will come with a heart rate of 150 beats per minute. Like this is, if you see 150 beats per minute, this is most likely atrial flutter. It can be other things like sinus tachycardia or, or atrial fibrillation even. The, heart, the atria here is firing at 300 beats per minute. The AV node, what it does is that it stops about half the block, half the impulses, but the other half go through. Now what happens is, when you have a supraventricular tachycardia, when you have very fast heart rate, 
how can you distinguish? Is this sinus tachycardia? Is this atrial flutter? Is this maybe ectopic atrial firing? Is this, there are different causes and you'll have a whole lecture about them. What you, how you differentiate is you look at the morphology of the P wave. If the P wave is fibrillation, then this is atrial fibrillation. If it's sawtooth, then it's atrial flutter. If it's normal sinus P wave, then this is sinus tachycardia. But the problem is when you have very fast heart rate, very close PRS complexes, you won't be able to see the P waves. So basically what they do, clinicians will induce an AV block in the patient. They will block the AV node. There are two ways they do this. If you remember normal physiology, you have the carotid baroreceptors. Mm -hmm. These will detect high blood pressure. When they're stimulated, they'll increase parasympathetic activity to the heart. Mm -hmm. Parasympathetic activity to the heart will slow down the SA node and slow the conduction through the AV node. So let's say a patient comes with very fast tachycardia, 100, 150 beats per minute. The physician will give them a carotid sinus massage. They'll massage the carotid sinuses. Now, when the parasympathetic input increases to the SA node, it would suppress it, but the SA node isn't the one firing here. The HA will continue to fire at its normal rate. But what happens when it slows the conduction through the AV node, the cure, the more, more uh, impulses from the HA will be blocked, so the QRS complexes will end up becoming wider and wider apart. If a patient comes with very fast tachycardia, 150, you can't see the P waves, you do carotid sinus massage and you get this pattern afterwards, you know that this is an atrial flutter. But is that clear? Basically, they induce an AV block. They stop the AV node so that they can see the P waves. Clear? You're right. Normally, these patients will present with tachycardia, 150 beats per minute usually. You slow down the AV node. There's another, there's a drug called adenosine, and you will learn about it in your, you will have a whole lecture on supraventricular tachycardia. This is a drug that blocks the AV node for like 10 to, it doesn't completely block it, it slows it down a lot though, for about 10 to 15 seconds. If a patient comes with very fast, 150 beats per minute, you give them adenosine. This is the pattern that you get, atrial flutter. Basically, you want to spread the QRS complexes apart so you can clearly see the P wave. But you're right, normally it won't look like this, it'll be very fast. Yes, you had a question. Yeah, it's still confusing because the flutter is, is, is the one causing the signal, not, not the SA node. Not the so SA when, we do, when we do this, the carotid sinus massage, yes. The SA node will be stopped, but yeah. still the flutter will. The flutter will, this isn't the SA node firing. This is the, yani masalan, if you have. Once it signal uh, through the ventricle, there is the fibrous string that wants to cause the AV node to conduct some of the signals going in the flutter. Yeah, it will. That's why you still, the heart doesn't stop completely, Shaf. It, they don't stop from PPC yeah, yeah, I know. It was 150. Now look at it. Now it's w almost, what, 75, 70. You took it from 150, you did carotid sinus massage, you dropped it to 75. That spreads the QRS complexes apart. Once you spread the QRS complexes apart, you can clearly see the P wave. Now, if you did carotid sinus massage and the heart rate comes back normal with sinus rhythm and SA node is, per, uh, P, P wave is fine and everything is fine, this was most likely a sinus tachycardia. Clear? Yeah. Okay. But you're right, normally these will present as tachycardia, so you slow down the heart rate, you slow down the AV node to see the P waves clearly. So you, you spread the QRS complexes to see the P wave clearly. Uh, after the P wave, we have the PR interval. Normally, this represents the delay of conduction at the AV node and the bundle of his. This is what it normally does. So you have about three to five small squares. You can memorize the time if you want, but when you're looking at the ECG, you'll count the squares. From the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex, this is the PR interval. Normally, it's three to five small squares. If it's prolonged, you have what's most likely an AV block. There are three different uh, degrees of block, and these are very important clinically, USMLE, and other things. So. This is a summary of the, 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 the blocks. First degree is only prolonged PR interval. Second degree, you'll have skipped beats. Third degree is complete dissociation. And there are different causes of AV block, like age-related changes, ischemia, drugs, infections. This is first degree block. We said first degree block, only prolonged PR interval. As you can, this is actually a picture from first aid for any of you who are using it. This is more than three. Let's start from here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Normally three to five. This is prolonged. And you check all the QRS complexes. Each P wave is followed by a QRS complex. There is no skip beats. This is first degree AV block. Basically what's happening, the AV node is not conducting as well as it should be. The impulses are becoming very slow through the AV node. So that's why you get prolonged PR interval. 
This is another example. Again, try to find one that starts at the beginning of a line. Here, this one. One, two, three, four, five. This is one large square, so it's five here. And then you have one, two. So you have about seven squares. No skip beats, first degree block. First degree block clear? Prolonged PR interval only, no skip beats. Then you're going to go on to second degree blocks. Second degree are, uh, is a bit more confusing because there are two types. You have Mobitz type 1, then you have Mobitz type 2. In all second degree blocks, or in both types, there will be skip beats. But the difference is the PR interval. In type 1, the PR interval is be, it gets slowly, slowly prolonged. Start from here. Look how short the PR interval is here. It's getting longer, it's getting longer, mm -hmm. it's getting longer, then it drops the beat here. Slowly, slowly getting longer. This is type 1. Type 1 slowly prolongs, then it drops the beat, and then it continues again here. You see, this is small, and then it gets long, longer, and then it's going to get longer and longer and longer until it drops the beat again. This is a second degree AV block, type 1. Yeah, it's again, it's the AV node is slow. It's not conducting the impulses. It's so slow now that some of the impulses don't even pass. Like here, you had a P wave, but the AV node didn't bother to conduct it. It's even slower now, yes. So here you have the P wave with the absent QA. You should see a P wave. Again, the, a, the, sign, the SA node is fine. Yeah. SA node here is contracting fine, but the AV node stops conduction here. And then it goes back again. SA, uh, PR, progressively prolonged, 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 until the AV node can't handle it anymore and, and skips the B. Now, okay, this is another example. You see this? Compare it with this, compare it with this, and then this P wave doesn't get conducted. Sure. This B was skipped. Type 2, the PR interval remains the same. Sure. So it's not slowly prolonging. It remains the same, but for some reason here, it just stops. Mm -hmm. It says, no, I don't want to conduct this one, and it stops. So look at this. PR1 is the same as PR2 is the same as PR3. They're the same. Is it normal for you? Huh? PR is normal? It can be. Can be. It can be. The most important thing here is that you're dropping the, 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 the skipping the beat. Okay. Yes. Again, second degree block, you have to have uh, a skip beat. The most important thing is the PR interval. If it's slowly prolonging, it's type 1. If it's without even prolonging, it just doesn't conduct the beat, then this is type 2. And actually, this is more worrisome, and these are the ones that may progress to type 3 AV block, and that's why you might have to give them a pacemaker. Mm -hmm. Again, look at this. PR interval is the same. Drop. It skips the beat. Then PR interval here is the same as the PR interval here. Clear? In, in type 1, PR interval is the same, and there's the prolonged ones. Are they the same? No, no, no. In type 1, they get slowly, slowly longer. Oh, look at this. Okay. This. No, look at that. Yeah, look at this right here. You see, this one is longer. The, this, the last one is the longest. This one is longer. It starts small, then longer, 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 skips the beat. So in first degree, it's just variable, but there's no beats. Uh, no skip no, beats. No it's skip beats. prolonged PR, no skip beats. The first, de first degree block is there's only prolonged PR. There's skip beats, yeah. This is no, no, this is, no, wait. Degree. Don't mix up first degree block. And then you have second degree block type 1. Okay, first degree block is only prolonged PR, no skip beats. The moment you start having skip beats, this is type 1. Uh, sorry, this is second degree block. If the PR interval is slowly getting longer before the beat skips, this is type 1, second degree block. If it's the same size, then it skips the beat, then this is type 2, second degree block. So what's happening in the AV node in this type 2? Type 2 is usually that it's had to even, it's usually not even the AV node, it might be even below the AV node in the bundle. And basically, what's happening, it could be anything from ischemic changes, age related fibrosis. But for some reason, it's slowly, for their periods, where it stops conducting. And this is the one that's worrisome because this is the one that, that usually, uh, uh, studies have shown that this is the one that usually progresses to the third degree block. And the third degree block is complete dissociation. AV, the, the SA node is firing by itself. And mm -hmm. the ventricles are firing by themselves. Mm -hmm. Look at this. You have P wave here. Then you have another P wave here. Then you have QRS. You have a P wave here. P wave here. P wave here. P wave comes on the QRS complex. P wave, P wave, P wave on the T wave. The atria is firing at its own rate. The SA node is firing at, uh, I'm sorry, the, the SA node and the, P, the, the atria is firing at its own rate. And the ventricle is firing at their own rate. Now remember what we said in the beginning when we were talking about the physiology. The SA node normally fires at what heart rate? 
The AV node in the bundle of his, what rate do they usually fire? Uh, 40, 40, to 40, to 40 to 60. The ventricles? 20 to 40. 20 to 40. Okay. So when you're measuring the QRS, the, the, the heart rate, and the difference between the QRS complexes, if the heart rate is between 40 to 60, then you know that the new pacemaker of this heart is? The AV node. The AV node. Because now the SA node, the impulses from the SA node are not coming. So the, the ventricles need a new pacemaker. If the heart rate is between 40 to 60, that means the new pacemaker is what? The AV node. The AV node, because that's how much the AV node fires. But sometimes the AV node is completely gone, it's not even... Can we turn this off? The... Okay, but if the ventricles are firing at a heart rate between 20 to 40, what's the new pacemaker of the heart? The ventricles. The ventricles themselves. The SA node normally fires at 60 to 100. If the SA node is no longer firing, either the AV node will take over, firing between 40 to 60, or the ventricles will take over, firing between 20 to 40. Let's look at this. Here, a, P wave, P wave, P wave, P wave, P wave, another P wave. But the QRS, look how many P waves you have. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, probably ten. And look how many QRS complexes you have. Three. The atrial rate I calculated, this is 90 beats per minute, which is normal. This is the SA node is the one controlling it. What about the ventricular rate? It's 33. What is the new pacemaker of this heart? The ventricles. The ventricles. It's between 20 to 40. And these patients, they need pacemakers. When you have the normal heart rates between 60 to 100 and all of a sudden the patient drops to 30 beats per minute, this is not good. So you need to pace the heart so that the heart rate is faster. Uh, yes? Okay. You have three pacemakers in your heart. You have the SA node, which fires between 60 to 100. AV node and bundle of his fire between 40 to 60. Ventricle fires 20 to 40. Now, if you have no more impulses coming from the SA node, Either the AV node will be the new pacemaker or the ventricle. If the AV node is the new pacemaker, the heart rate will be between 40 to 60, 45, 53, something like that. If the ventricle is the new pacemaker, it'll be 20 to 40. Here, it's 33 beats per minute. What's the new pacemaker of this patient's heart? The huh? The ventricle. So we call this a ventricular escape rhythm. Now the patient, the, the patient escaped from the AV block by the ventricles. The ventricles started firing on their own. Clear? Huh? Because, because the ventricles know that the SA nodes and the AV nodes are not firing. Are not firing, so the ventricle picks up by itself. The ventricle, if you take the ventricle by itself, it will fire at 20 to 40 beats per minute. So if, if I understand this correctly, okay. if, it's, um, if it's less than 60, yeah. and the AV nodes will start bleeding, right? It depends. Sometimes the AV node is too diseased, it won't even be, be a pacemaker. It depends. And then, and then the, that means that the heart rate will go down to about 40. Less than 40, even. Yes, yes. Like in this case, the AV node is so, so diseased, it won't even, it's not even firing. Here, only the ventricles are the ones firing. Sometimes you could have a complete AV block, but at a heart rate of 55. This is, that means that the AV node now is taking over. The AV node is the one firing, yes. Yes. Okay. Same, same, same thing. You take this one. And then calculate the number of large squares between it, like this one here. This one is on the QRS. Calculate the number of large squares, one, two, three, a bit more than three, and it's less than 100. It's around 90 beats per minute. You divide 300 by the number of large squares, this is the atrial rate. But if you want to calculate the heart rate, I mentioned it before, always use the QRS complex to calculate the heart rate. Then in this case, if you use the P waves, it'll tell you that the heart rate is 90 beats per minute, which is not correct. The heart rate here is 33, it's the ventricular rate. Because when you're feeling the pulse, what are you feeling? You're not feeling the atrial contraction. Ventricular. You're feeling the ventricular contraction. So the ventricular rate is always the heart rate. Oh, okay. okay? No, and no, you know which... This is more dangerous. No, the atrial, this is just... I'm just showing you why you don't use the P waves to calculate the heart rate. You use the QRS complex. This is why you use the QRS. So if somebody tell, starts using the P wave to calculate the heart rate, they'll get a heart rate of 90, which is not correct. You use the QRS complexes. Doctor, yes. what's the difference between uh, the ECG of type 2 uh, okay. uh, can be given the feet and the type uh, step degree? Because Third degree, uh, there's... We have B wave yeah. and we can have skip 
feet here. So how do you differentiate? No, no, there, the, you differentiate if you, the uh, atria is firing at a different rate from the ventricle. Yeah, you completely, yeah, you look, when you have a P wave in the QRS complex, it's complete dissociation. You see here you have one, and then you have one inside, and then you have two, and then you have three, and then you have one here, one here. So you look, you see the atria, the atria is firing at its own rate, you calculate here. You see the atria is firing at its own rate, and the ventricles are firing at their own rate. But when you start seeing, but this is why it's very important when you're looking at the ECG, don't look at one thing. You're right. And you must have, if I'm looking here, I'd say, okay, this is a skip beat. If I'm only looking at this area, I'd say, okay, this was a P wave, skip beat. Another P wave, this is a second degree block. But you have to look at all the ECG strip. You start from beginning to end. And this is, you're right, this is confusing. A lot of times we say that this is a second degree block, but then the doctor tells us, no, start from the beginning, look at the P waves. Another way you can do it is count the number of P waves and count the number of QRS complexes. If they're different, they're very different, then this is, and here you have 10 P waves, three QRS complexes. Mm -hmm. And it's a second degree, and they are four, just three three. Wave, three, three, three. You have some skip beats. You might have less than eight P waves or ten. No, no much difference. No much difference, yeah. But then look, you, you, here you can see a sinus rhythm. Here you see a normal sinus rhythm. Sinus rhythm, sinus rhythm. Because you don't see that here. And okay, you can say this one maybe, but then this P wave comes right here, this P wave here, this P wave here. This, there's a P wave in the QRS here and here. Once you start seeing P waves in the QRS complex also, you know this is complete dissociation. Mm -hmm. So if we see the uh, Q wave, uh, the Q wave in the uh, QRS complex, this is this, this is complete. This is this is complete dissociation because normally they shouldn't be firing like this. Yeah. So many skip beats. So that will be like more likely yeah. to be said. And there's another hint that we'll discuss later on about there's this. One small there's okay. one T wave there, right? Okay, the T wave is difficult. Yes, there's this, yeah, yeah. It's not really a T wave. This might be some repolarization happening here. Uh, but I think actually this is more of an educational uh, ECG, drawn ECG. Okay. Yeah, but you, this could be, there could be repolarization happening here, yes. Okay, the next thing, we discussed the P wave, okay. the PR interval, the QRS complex. This represents, obviously, ventricular depolarization. The Q wave is the first negative deflection following the PR segment. The R wave is the first positive deflection following the Q wave. And the S wave is the first negative deflection. Uh, after the R wave. Q, R, S. Should be less than three small squares. Now, there is something called a pathological Q wave. Look at the Q waves here. Two, three, and ABF. Look at them, they're small. Now compare them to the ones here. Two, three, look at the Q waves in three, yeah. and ABF. Look how deep they are. This, these are pathological Q waves. They're large Q waves. Now, again, when it comes to criteria, there are different criteria. Some will tell you, if the Q wave is more than 25% of the R wave, this is pathological. Others will tell you if it's more than 30% of the Q wave, uh, the R wave, the Q wave is pathological. So it depends on what criteria you're required to learn. But what you can tell, but this is obvious, and this is almost half or almost the same size as the R wave. This indicates a previous myocardial infarction. Now, question. 2, 3, and AVF are involved. Which part of the heart had the infarction? Well, two, two, three, 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 um, two. Yeah, yeah, it's inferior. Inferior. Yeah. Which vessel most likely involved? Uh, right. No, right corner. Right. 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 <laughs> large amplitude QRS, ventricular hypertrophy. When you start seeing things like this, once it's leaving the ECG strip, this is most likely a ventricular hypertrophy. And wide QRS. Now, remember which had the, which which. Uh, Fibers had the fastest rate of conduction in the heart? Yes, Purkinje fibers. So that's why when the, we know that the horizontal axis represents the duration, the time. So if you notice, the QRS complex is very, very small, uh, very narrow. It's very thin. Why? Because the Purkinje fibers stimulate all the heart very quickly. This is milliseconds. And if you look at it, it's almost as thin as the P wave. Basically, the ventricles get depolarized just as quickly as the atria. Why? Because the Purkinje fibers are there. Now, what happens if an impulse, let's say, originates from the ventricle? Let's say here, an impulse starts here. Rather than coming down from the SA node, we have an ectopic beat, an abnormal beat that starts from within the ventricle. Okay, there may be inversion, you're right, because the axis could be different. That's one thing. There may be a change in the axis, so the waves may be different in, in, in their axis. 
Another thing is now the impulse will not be transmitted by the Purkinje fibers because it's not coming from the bundle of his, the left bundle branches and then the Purkinje fibers. The impulse will be transmitted through the ventricular muscle fibers. Correct? Ventricular muscle fibers are slower. Slow, yeah. So it will take more time. Oh. Look at the difference between this and this. What about the signals coming from the bundle of his? No. Uh, okay, excellent. The, the, what if a signal is coming? What if... Okay, leave that question. We'll come back to it. The first refractory phase? No, no, we'll come back to that. Just, just wait. But is this clear? When the impulse is being transmitted through the ventricular muscle fibers, it will be slow, so you'll have a wide QRS. When it's being transmitted through the Purkinje fibers, as usual, it will be fast, narrow QRS. Okay. What can you see? With, what's wrong with the QRS here? Very wide. Yeah, obviously. It's wide. <laughs> yes, it's wide. It's more than three. More than three small squares. Now, it's probably difficult to see. It's probably difficult to see the large squares here, but I think you've seen enough ECGs today to know is this fast heart rate or slow or not? It's very slow. Fast. Very slow, yeah. Huh? It's very fast. Oh, it's, yes, okay, the depo yeah, you're right. The depolarization is slow because it's wide, but the heart rate itself is very fast. What do we call this? Okay, good, but where is it coming from? Okay, it's coming from the ventricles, exactly. So this is ventricular tachycardia. Wide QRS, complex tachycardia. Now, the rhythm seems regular, actually. Ventricular tachycardia. Now, look at this. Why is look at this hard here? Why is it sometimes the ectopic beat just fires quickly, but it usually has to be tachycardia. Why? So it can beat the impulses from the SA node. So the 2040. Huh? 2040. Yeah, this is we're talking about disease now. This isn't physiology. Okay. There's a disease, some ischemia happening to some area that's causing it to depolarize very quickly. This is pathology. Oh, myocytes, not Purkinje. Myocytes, yes, that's why it's it's wide QRS complex because it's coming from the ventricles and it's being transmitted through the ventricles, ventricular fibers. Look at these. Uh -huh. This is important. This is one of the most important ECGs you must remember. What is this? Fibrillation. Fibrillation, exactly. This is ventricular fibrillation. This is lethal. This is probably the most dangerous finding you will have on a uh, ECG. ECG now. Remember what we said about atrial fibrillation, multiple re-entry circuits, the atria is not contracting as a whole. Yeah. The most worrisome thing there is stasis of the blood and clot. Yeah. Basically the atria is not contracting so the blood stays there. But when the ventricle is not contracting and the blood stays there, you're not worried about clotting. You're worried about the blood not going anywhere. The blood anywhere. not going anywhere. The blood is stuck in the heart. It's not, going, it's not going to the brain, it's not going anywhere. So these patients usually collapse, you need CPR and defibrillation. This is what happens in those movies with the... Yeah, yeah the... Yeah. Clear. Okay, back to our old friend. <laughs> Remember? Yeah. Third degree AV block. Remember why we said that this is a ventricular pacemaker now? Because the heart rate was between 20 to 40? Now we have another reason why we know that the, the heart rate is coming from the ventricle here. Yes, exactly. Thank you. The QRS complex is wide. We said the first reason was that the heart rate here is between 20 to 40. That means it's the ventricle. Another reason, if you see here, this is more than three small squares. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This was the normal? The normal is less than three. Okay. Less than three is the normal. This is wide QRS. So you have third degree block. So either the AV node or the ventricle is the pacemaker. When you have the heart rate between 20 to 40 and it's a wide QRS, what, will, what does this mean? The ventricular. The heart rate is between 20 to 40 and the QRS complex is wide. That means this heart rate is coming from the ventricle, not from the AV node. But this is this clear? Yeah. There is no tachycardia in this pathology. No, no, there's no, there isn't bradycardia. This is severe bradycardia. This is 33. Is this clear? Yeah. Yeah. Between 20 to 40 and wide QRS. Now, let's say you had another third degree block, but the heart rate is 50 and the QRS complex is narrow. What's the pacemaker here? The AV node. Exactly, the AV node. The AV node because we know that the heart rate is between. 40 to 60 is the AV node. But why would the QRS complex be narrow? That's not. It's, not, uh, it's, not uh, it's coming from, from the... Exactly. The it's going from the bundle, the, from, the left, from the bundle of his. It's going through the uh, bundle branches and the Purkinje fibers like it should normally. So the heart rate between 40 to 60 with a narrow QRS, this means that it's coming from the AV node going through the bundles and the Purkinje fibers. Less than 40, between 20 to 40 with wide QRS, this means that it's originating from the ventricles and it's spreading through the ventricular muscle fibers. So would 
such a Redmi I want the sympathetic system fire? Yes. You can, that's why sometimes the atrial rate can be high. Because the SA node will have higher stimulation. But that's why, again, we measure the ventricular heart rate. Is this clear? Yeah. I hope I'm not confusing anybody. Okay. If you have any questions, again, please don't hesitate. It's regarding my question earlier, you said no. Yeah. But wasn't that the answer? If it's coming, you asked me if it's coming from the AV node. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. Yes, come on. So it will be narrow? Yeah. yeah. Okay? Okay. Yeah, no, I remember. That's why I said it. <laughs> but like, look at this. Here, if we start from the beginning of the patient data, then we go through the three R's, the rhythm. Rhythm here seems regular, 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 but then all of a sudden, you've got this irregularity here and this irregularity here. Another thing you have is, here it's sinus, sinus, sinus. The relation is fine. The heart rate here is fine. The relation is sinus rhythm. But then all of a sudden, here is not sinus. There's no clear P wave coming before. Okay, what about the QRS complex here? It's wide. It's wide. Mm -hmm. And look at the axis. As someone clearly mentioned from above, the axis would be different. Yes. Why? Because now this is originating, the impulse is coming from, a, mm -hmm. from the ventricle in a different area. So that's why it's, it's not following the normal axis. But ischemia. There could be, if ischemia could be a reason. What do we call this condition? A block? No, not a block. This is the ventricle firing before it should be. It is a fire. It could be a problem. Thank you. It's premature ventricular contraction. Basically, the ventricle is firing by itself prematurely. And this is probably, this is why, why? Because it's going through the ventricular muscle fibers. It's not coming down from the atria and the uh, AV node and the bundle of his and the Purkinje fibers. This is an ectopic area in the ventricle that started firing by itself, maybe because of ischemia. And as a result, you have this contraction that happens before, it happens early, and it's wide because it's going through the ventricular muscle fibers. Uh, uh, first, yes. Can we call this uh, inverted uh, QRS? There is an inverted, yeah, because again, this is probably coming, let's say, from the inferior right side and going up. Okay. Because this is, yes, it, it is inverted. If you compare it to this one, it is inverted. The axis is different here because it's not coming from top to bottom, as it should be. It's yeah, maybe starting from the bottom and is going in the reverse direction. Okay, why is it inverted? Well, let me find a heart. Where is a heart? Where is a heart? Um, okay, let's say the impulse, instead of, normally the impulse comes like this, correct? Yeah. And it will give this way, correct? What if the impulse starts here and goes this way? What? Or maybe it's two or three, but then, by, and then after that it stops. The premature ventricular contraction is an ectopic beat, ectopic area that fires maybe one, two, or three beats, and then it stops. And then the normal heart rate resumes. Here, you can see this was a premature contraction. There's like a little pause, and then the normal heart rate comes back. And then this one fires again, then the normal heart rate takes over. This, you can see wide QRS complex, correct? Wide QRS complex, wide QRS complex. Now, this is a left bundle branch block. Again, you have right, you have left. There are different criteria for the, each one, and they should be mentioned in your lecture. And you will memorize the criteria, but what I want to do today is help you understand why is uh, the QRS complex wide and left bundle branch blocked. Let's say this is the heart. This area gets blocked. This is the left bundle. It's ischemia, for example. This patient had a septal MI, and this area got blocked. It's no longer conducting. The right part of the ventricle, the right ventricle will contract normally. Correct? The right bundle will transmit the impulses here normally. What's going to happen is that the right ventricle will send the impulses to the left side from the by the ventricular muscle fibers. It's not going to leave the left ventricle alone. It will send the left ventricle impulses, but through the ventricular muscle fibers, that's why it takes longer time, and that's why in bundle branch blocks you will have wide QRS. Huh? I'm sorry? Okay, yeah. Now we said, if this is the way the heart's firing, the impulse will come down very quickly through the Purkinje fibers to both sides. Very fast uh, contraction, uh, depolarization, both sides, narrow QRS. Now, we block this area. Ischemia, for example, happens here, and this area gets blocked. The left bundle branch. The right bundle branch will transmit the impulses to the right ventricle through the Purkinje fibers very quickly, but 
what happens is the impulses go from the right ventricle to the left ventricle through the ventricular muscle fibers. Basically, the right ventricle starts depolarizing the left ventricle through the muscle fibers. But the muscle fibers, as we know, are slow. So that's why it will take a longer time for the left ventricle to depolarize, and that's why the QRS complex is wide. And if you notice, it's not very wide, because the right ventricle contracts quickly enough. It's just the left ventricle that's slow a bit, so that's why it's a bit wide. Here it's more than three small How squares. How do we differentiate from other ventricles, like other, like the other, other wide QRS? Okay, does this look like a PVC? No, this is continuous. It can be a PVC is like one or two beads. Yeah. Sloth? It's not a PVC. Is this a ventricular tachycardia? Does mm. this look like that? No. It's a normal, usually normal heart rate, and then there are other findings. You will, like, you, when you study them, you will see that there's, there's these, these rabbit ears here. I call them rabbit ears. You see the rabbit ears? Yeah. These six? Yeah. Those are part of the diagnosis. Uh -huh. You will learn about the bundle branch blocks. I don't want to go into too much details. I uh, know this will complicate things and make things more confusing. But I just want you, do you understand why there is slow conduction, slow yeah. depolarization in the ventricles if there is a bundle branch block? Do you understand why there's a white QRS here? Okay. Hold on. We're almost done. PR interval. I'm sorry, this is another thing about the... Here you can see that the PR interval... Very... Very small. Very small, yeah. What about the QRS complex? Very oh, wide. Why? No, no, no. It's not delayed. The PR interval here is very narrow. Okay, okay. Wait, wait. So here we said the PR interval is very, uh, is very short. Basically what that means is that the impulse is going down from the atria to the ventricle faster. This is the opposite of an AV block. Yeah, yeah, no, but okay, no here, block in the AV node. There, there is, there is, normally the AV node will block the impulse, correct? Yeah. If you have an AV block, the PR interval gets prolonged. Yeah. What happen, What would cause the PR interval to be short? Uh, no, not overstimulation. There's another thing. It's a bypass trap. What happens is that there's a muscle from the atria to the ventricle, a band of, this is a pathology, of course. Exposed. A band of muscle from the atria to the ventricle, we know what's the slowest thing in the heart. What's the slowest conductor in the heart? AV node. AV node. AV node is the slowest. Ventricles are are the are slow, but they're not as slow as the AV node. If there's ventricular muscle pathology between the atria and the ventricle, this will conduct it faster than the AV node. Uh -huh. So the Purkinje fibers are the fastest. Then you have the atria and the ventricles, and then you have the AV node. So what happens here? This is this um, again. I'm not going to go into too much detail here. But this is a disease called Wolf Parkinson White. You will learn about it in your clinical lectures, and it's also present in first aid for the USMLE. But basically, you have muscles from the atria to the ventricle. So it bypasses the AV node. That's why you have a shortened PR, because there's no delay now. And you have this thing we call the delta wave. And then you'll have the white QRS. Which leaves do you see in all of them? You can see them in all. You can see them in some. This is a mnemonic to help you remember this. Wolf, Parkinson, Y, and Noah Gushana. Delta wave, W. PR interval is short. Y, QRS. Okay? Delta wave. This is the delta wave. And you see the early depolarization on one side because this side gets depolarized early, but you get the delta wave. Okay. Clear? So here, the PR interval is short because now it's not going through the AV node. It's going through a faster way, which is the ventricle. And this is a mnemonic to help you remember Wolf Parkinson White. Okay, would like to continue. Okay, <laughs> read. Okay, Mr. X returns to the ER three months later uh, with severe crushing center chest pain for the best hour uh, and SOV, sweating, nausea, and vomiting. The pain spreads to his left arm and is not relieved by sublingual NTV. Uh, so, now what are you worried about here? Heart failure. No, myocardial infarction. Myocardial infarction, yes. This is an acute MI most likely. What do you see here? Oh, this is oh, okay, this is like the most important ECG finding that you should know, the ST elevation. ST elevation. Try high. Yes. Elevation. You can see very clear ST elevation here, here, here. Now we're gonna talk about the next thing which is the ST segment. Okay. But first of all I'm gonna talk about a bit about coronary vessel disease because this causes some confusion. 
because the doctors kept using this term angina, coronary vessel disease, acute coronary syndrome, and none of us understood it. So I summarized it here quickly. Stable angina was what Mr. X had previously. Chest pain with exertion relieved by rest. Yeah. Cardiac chest pain. If this chest pain suddenly changes, worsens, is no longer relieved, becomes prolonged, we call this acute coronary syndrome. Okay? He had chest pain. I had stable angina first. Then he came with acute coronary syndrome right now. Acute coronary syndrome could be three types. It could be unstable angina, non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, and STEMI, which is ST elevation. Now, uh, unstable angina and non-ST elevation myocardial infarction will have similar changes on the ECG. ST depression or T wave changes. The important differentiating factor is angina will never cause positive enzymes. Angina, angina does not cause necrosis. You have myocardial infarction, you get positive cardiac enzymes. And then you have the ST elevation, which is obviously ST elevation myocardial infarction. This is our patient. He had ST elevation, as you can clearly see. In V1, V2, V3, V4, V5. Which area of the heart is this? From V1 to V5. Anterior lateral, yes. The left coronary artery. Normally, the ST segment should be flat, similar to the TP segment. Now, there are different criteria. Again, some will say one, others will say two small squares and at least two consecutive leads. If it's more than two, this is clear. And again, the leads show the affected site. Here we have V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. What is this? From V2 to V6. Which area of the heart is Anterior lateral. Don't forget the other lateral leads, huh? One in AVL. You see, one in AVL are also lateral leads, huh? They'll also have elevation. Can you see this elevation here? Yeah. Compare this portion with this. It should be like here. It should be all flat on this line. Look how elevated it is. It's like four or five small squares. These are the different forms of ST elevation. And you could have the other side, ST depression. Look at here. Mm -hmm. Look at these areas. It should be on this level. This, is, this could be angina or this could be non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. You differentiate by enzymes. If enzymes positive, no? Yeah, could be ischemia. You have the QT interval, which is from the end of the QRS complex till the beginning of the T wave, up to 11 small squares. It can be prolonged, which could be as a result of congenital disease or uh, electrolyte changes or drugs. And we worry about prolonged QT interval because it can cause uh, tersad the points. And this is a prolonged QT interval. Look at this. Take this side, for example. Look at this, one large square two large squares, three large squares. This is 15 small squares. We said the maximum is up to 11, 10 to 11. This is 15. This is clearly a prolonged QT. Clear? And then it may become this. This is a prolonged QT. This is tersat the point, which is simply a fancy ventricular tachycardia. And this is what we worry about in prolonged QT. Huh? This is the point. It's a ventricular tachycardia that happens in prolonged QT patients. So if a patient has prolonged QT like this, and then all of a sudden they develop this pattern, we call this the point. Does it become regular by then? Uh, it may, or you may have to intervene with drugs or electric. The last thing, the T wave. T wave represents ventricular repolarization. After the ventricle depolarizes, it needs to repolarize. It may be deranged in ischemia, inflammation, electrolyte abnormalities. T wave changes, the good thing about ischemic T wave changes is that anything can happen. It could be peaked, it could be flattened, it could be inverted. Just mention T wave changes and like a guaranteed, guaranteed answer. So T wave changes, any T wave change can happen in ischemia. And electrolyte imbalance, the most important electrolyte for T waves is the potassium. Hyperkalemia, high T waves, hypokalemia, Low T waves. Hyper, high, hypo, low. Here you may have other changes like wide QRS, and here you can also see a U wave, which is a wave after the T wave. Clear? I mean, like, this is, I don't know why these changes happen, but this is, these are the classic changes hyperkalemia, high T wave, hypokalemia, depressed T wave. Case, who would like to continue? Mr. X was admitted and managed as in STEMI. He was doing fine initially, but at the end of his first day in the hospital, he suddenly lost consciousness. With a very low blood pressure and the nurses could not feel his pulse. 
Cool. This EEG monitor showed the following facts. What are you most likely expecting? No, no heart failure. Huh? Huh? Okay, well, what about this? Oh, no, he didn't have long QT. If he had long QT, then develop this, okay, we'll call it to set the points. But this is Mr. X from the, the guy with the chest pain. No. And another thing, to set the points is a form of ventricular tachycardia, so they may not be, they might, this guy lost consciousness, and he could not feel, the, his pulse could not be felt. To set the points will be clear, patient with prolonged QT, then develop this pattern. If they didn't mention prolonged QT, don't mention to set the points. To set the points only comes in prolonged QT. So it will be a clear case of prolonged QT, then a pattern like this, okay, you say to set the points. But a patient who had an MI, lost consciousness, no pulse felt, this is his pattern? What is this? Ventricular, ventricular fibrillation. What do you do? Okay. Ventricular tachycardia, if we go back to it, let's just go back to ventricular tachycardia. I'll show you ventricular tachycardia. Look at the difference between this and this. This is regular. This is this is clear pattern. This is an obvious pattern. And look at this. Compare these two. Do these two look the same? This is fibrillation. Different size waves, different shapes. All unusual. You see? Okay. Let's go back. So this patient had ventricular fibrilla uh, fibrillation. What do you do? Uh, CPR. CPR and defibrillate. If he has fibrillation, defibrillate him. This is important clinical information. If a patient dies on their way to the hospital after an MI, it's most likely. Uh, arrhythmia, if they die within the first few days, most likely arrhythmia. Last, last part of our presentation, who would like to finish, who would like to conclude? Okay, yes please. Is it ready? Yes, read. Okay. The patient was managed uh, appropriately and, uh, and survived. He was discharged several days later on appropriate medication. He was lost to follow up, but presented to the ER several years later with sudden onset of Okay, what did this patient develop here? This is a stroke, exactly. Someone. Okay. What's the relation between palpitations and stroke in the brain? Okay, let's see what the ECG showed. Who would like to start it off? Aethyl. Okay. A white QRS. No. Three, one, two, yani. Three. It's not that white. Uh, what lead is this? Okay, wait, wait. Someone said atrial flutter here. Okay, thank you very much. It's irregular. We sh that's why I gave you guys the, the nobody, everybody went right away and jumped to the diagnosis. Nobody took the steps. We know the patient data. Start with the rhythm. The rhythm here is clearly irregularly irregular. Look at this. Look at this. Irregular, most likely atrial uh, fibrillation. Now, if you take the heart rate, let's say this is 10 seconds. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10 times 6, 60. Okay, normal. We can't say if it's sinus or not because the P wave is abnormal. P wave, these are fibrillation waves. This is, that's why in atrial fibrillation you need to anticoagulate the patients because they can develop stroke, thrombosis and stroke. Revision. Atrial flutter will be sawtooth appearance. Large sawtooth appearance and regular. Okay, let's revise one last time the components of the ECG. You start with what? Patient data. Patient data. Trichotard. The next thing you have? Trichotard. The three R's. Okay, which are? Rate, rhythm, 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 rhythm,
Now, if anybody had any questions about this, I was going to explain this. Honestly, it's just physics. Oh, I thought I can explain better than I can. If you have any questions, ask, ask Tara. Thank you. Yeah.